Today we're talking with Paniotti Akeladis, or AKA PK That's for it. short. Uh, you're the senior curator and director of outreach at the Denver Botanic Gardens. I am indeed. So one of your specialties really is the cultivation of native alpine and xeric species. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. When I started at Denver Botanic Gardens, it was pretty much a park with mostly just, uh, you know, annuals and, and fairly common things. And I developed the first big display of perennials at the Botanic Gardens just as the perennial explosion occurred. So how did you get interested in that maybe versus sort of the typical? Well, I suppose it's the way a lot of, you know, I was one of those little plant nerds, you know. There's some, <laughs> occasionally you get these kids who are really into, especially cacti or succulents, but uh, growing up in the Rockies like I did mm -hmm. and spending a lot of time in the mountains with my family, uh, fishing and whatever, the wildflowers in the Rockies are, are, are so spectacular, spectacular. that, uh, you know, I always was interested in wildflowers. And, right. and eventually, I, it suddenly became my career. It's always interesting to hear about how people sort of got bit by the plant bug. And especially nowadays, since there's an increasing plant blindness and there's a sort of a decline in botany and why it's so important. So it's, I, I always find it very fascinating to hear uh, each person's story. So you're also the co-author of Steps, the Plants and Ecology of the World's Semi-Arid Regions. What is a step? Most people, if they hear the words, the step concept, they think of Russia. And Russia has these vast grasslands that they called in Russian step, which ah. meant step. But that word was gradually applied more and more to that kind of climate region across Asia. And uh, uh, just like the Mediterranean climate region occurs in, Fran in California, South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, we realized that people didn't realize that how similar these climate regions were around the world that are in the middle of continents that are very cold and dry and have grass. So this is the first book, I think, that really has highlighted the fact that we have these sister climates in South America, South Africa, Asia, and, and especially in the heart of America. A lot of people know about the woodlands of the east. Sure. And they know about, you know, the California coast. Right. And they, and they right. know about uh, Florida. Right. But people don't realize that there's this phenomenal climatic zone that occupies most of the United States which we have replaced mostly with corn and soybeans and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, wheat, and that this is one of the richest biological regions in North America. And I was surprised to find there's, there's really a lot of variety in there. Uh, absolutely, well, what, 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 do you, what do we eat? Well, we eat grains, which of course are grass. Mm -hmm. So the dominant element of a step is grass. And then what else do we eat? We eat things like beans and pulses, and so the bean family is number two. And, uh, and then you have the things like the cress family, it turns out the families of plants that predominate in the steppe regions of the world are what we eat. And that's because we are products of the steppe. The humans actually evolved on the steppes of South Africa and gradually wandered to the steppes of Central Asia. So we are right. steppe children of the world. <laughs> and so, you know, what, you want to know what the steppe is? It's what we eat. Well, that's, uh, wow, I, I, that's really, really interesting, steppe children. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I like yeah. it. Well, what, so what, for you, what makes these communities so unique, these sort of, this, these plant compositions of the steppe? What makes it different from, say, just a prairie or, or something like that? Well, prairies are parts of the steppe phenomenon. Right. And in North America, it really includes the tall grass prairie, the short grass prairie, all of that is steppe. And it's essentially areas that get extremely cold winters, usually down around zero or so, and then hot summers, and where the landscape is predominant, predominantly uh, grasslands. Mm -hmm. So that's most of the world's steppe regions uh, kind of fit that uh, MO. And in the United States, you're really looking at central Texas is kind of the south end of that. Right. And then it goes all the right. way up to Canada. And right. that is the breadbasket of North America. Sure. It's also, you know, one of the most important areas where people are moving, just like here in Austin right. and in Denver, is become a major focus. So the steppe has become an area where people first rose and developed into human beings. And right. now we're kind of in, 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 in inundating these steppe regions again. Right. And I think it's we have to know what, we're, what we have lost and what we should preserve. And right. a lot of that is my, the interest of why we did this book. Okay. Well, also, I'm uh, looking into this, there are also abiotic components of steppes that are just as important as the plants or have a, a profound influence in these areas? Well, yeah, obviously the, the fact that you have uh, most of the steppe regions have a mountain range to their west. That right. kind of keeps the rainfall. That's what, what governs the dryness of the con conditions that you have. 
then you have the, the situation, the prevailing winds. Uh, right. uh, but what really, I think, more than anything else, the extreme, climatic extremes uh, are what have created these conditions. But uh, I think what makes them so compelling is the fact that because you have these extreme conditions, the plants that have evolved there are extremely diverse because every little niche is a little different. Right. So if you're in, in England, for example, no matter where you plunk your rhododendron, it'll grow. <laughs> but when, you're, when you come from a climate like uh, Central Texas or Colorado or, or much of the steppe, a shady area, you could have ferns. You could right. have things from moist climates. Right. If it's a hot exposed area, you might have cacti and succulents. Right. And then you have the grasslands. So you have these incredible subtle microclimatic mm -hmm. factors and that's what people have in their home gardens as well. So if you're trying to garden in some place like Kansas, if you want to grow rhododendron, boy, you better put in a lot of humus and water it all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And, and so you have to learn how to manage microclimate much better in a climate like this step. I'd like to go a little bit now into sort of the design aspect of this, right? So what what is your strategy and when, when it comes to planting designs using these plant communities versus, you know, it, it seems like these lend themselves more towards uh, a, 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 a more integrated approach versus, you know, what people might typically think of a flower bed or something. Well, or I could think you do either. Theater, theoretically, you could have a very standard, very conventional flower bed with just step plants. Right. It could be done. And I, in fact, we actually recently, uh, one of our colleagues uh, designed a garden like that using very drought, drought loving plants. Right. And it works. Right. You can do that. But you really have to consider, for example, in Colorado, when I was born, we only had about a million people. Mm -hmm. And now we're approaching seven million. Wow. And yet we have the same amount of water coming from the mountains. Now we've had a couple of wet years, so nobody worries, but we're going to have a drought. And when you have a drought, now we have a million more people with their straws in the, in the, in the water, so to speak. Right. So if we really want to have landscapes that can survive over time, you have to have plants that can right. survive over time. And these drought periods usually last three or four years. And if you have trees that need a lot of water, right. shrubs that need a lot of water, they just die. Right. So part of the reason we're looking at these plants is number one, they will live. Right. So, and it turns out that a lot of the steppe plants are spectacularly showy. We just haven't bothered. For example, uh, uh, one of my hosts here in, 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 in Texas, uh, uh, Scott Ogden, found this grass growing mm -hmm. near Dallas called, it's a muley grass, right. and it's a Texas muley, and, and we introduced it through Plant Select. It's the most beautiful grass you can imagine. Uh, it's Muhlenbergia reversionii, and it's, right. a, it's in a Texas native, yeah. and it's become an important garden plant wow. all over the United States. It turns out if it grows in West Texas, Central Texas, it's probably going to grow other places. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, it's one of the most beautiful. And guess what? It's become a hugely popular plant in Europe. Even wow. though it's not a step condition there, it'll right. adapt. I've certainly heard people say, well, some of these native plants are, aren't as showy, or they, you know, they, they, or, or they, they don't see as much variety um, in, in, in some of them. I well, mean, there's the wildflowers. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to disagree. I think uh, what, what the, the, some of the most spectacular plants that are used in gardens all over the world are our prairie plants. Right. The echinaceas, yes. the rudbeckias, so many of the things, the lupins, the, the mm -hmm. Texas blue bottom, these are gorgeous. And they're the basis of the English border. I think the trouble is that we have brainwashed people into thinking that things have to look a certain way. Right. And the fact is that uh, our native plants done well are more beautiful, and uh, I have seen gardens that uh, are, are native and adapted, and they're more beautiful because they actually adapt to the nat landscape and the gardeners don't have to kill themselves to maintain them. And in the long run, you can create gardens that you can walk away from and they won't fall apart. I'd like to know your thoughts as well. I, this, certainly a lot of the things that we hear when we deal with native plants at the Wildflower Center is that, uh, you know, they want that evergreen sort of thing or always flowering that, that a lot of some, you know, and a lot of that comes out with traditional gardening through planting of annuals and just circulating that out. But something that I definitely find quite rich is that you get these textures and the seasonality with these natives that change over time. And so they're, they're, they're not necessarily a static, you know, we tend to think of our gardens as always having to look a certain way, yeah. but when you plug in with some of these natives, they, they offer you this whole yeah, different yeah. view. I get you, and I mean, there is a way, you know, you plant some petunias or you plant some things, you get this nice patch of color. 
but you know, you can get that with the salvia. Right. You can get that with Agastachys, for example. Those right. are southwestern natives. Now, it is a slightly different texture, but eventually, once you acquire that texture, you look at these banks of just the same solid color, and it gets boring after a while. Sure. But part of the reason we go look at things like our native grasses is you have a garden that incorporates some grasses, some succulents, some native shrubs, and that really works year round. And you don't have to kill yourself every couple of months by tearing everything out and starting over again. Right. And there's nothing like the grass moving in the wind. I think once people understand and utilize our native plants intelligently, they'll never go back because it's so much more gratifying and so much deeper. Well, Peniotti, I thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. This is a quite enriching uh, discussion. And uh, we just, I really enjoyed spending time with you and I think the, the audience will as well. Uh, well, coming up next is Daphne to answer all your questions. Mm -hmm.